My name is Christoph. I'm the commercial director of a digital agency called Spark. Um, we work closely with our community in Bulgaria. We know the guys are up, so let's just give them a round of applause for the awesome job they've done. Good job, guys. I'll try to be your MC for today. Uh, try to help this go smoothly. Just a couple of quick announcements before I introduce the first speaker today. We have a great little award for the person who tweets the most today. It's the X Mini Uno Castle speaker, which is amazing. I actually tried it myself. So tweet as much as you can. Uh, hashtag should be somewhere uh, on these boards, and you can get this at the end. I'll try to hand it to you personally. All right. Without further ado, I just want to introduce Rob Fitzpatrick first. He has successfully bankrupted three tech companies. Good job, Rob. Good job. He, that actually is an achievement. I think it is. Uh, he's a Y Combinator alum. He's built products that have been used by brands such as Sony and MTV. Um, he has successfully raised funding in the US and in the UK, which is quite impressive. And he's the author of The Mum Test, which is what he's going to talk about today. How to learn from customers when everybody is lying to you. Off to you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so I, I fell into startups largely accidentally. I wanted to be an academic. I was doing my research and kind of on a whim, like I realized that academia wasn't as much fun as I had hoped it was going to be. And I found out about startups and I thought that looks amazing. You know, you, you work with your friends, you control your, your time and location, you can choose exactly what you work on. There's very little um, sort of pretending to be busy and there's a lot more doing stuff that actually matters you know, to you, to your customers, to whoever. Uh, so I loved it. So in, in 2007, we went through Y Combinator, uh, and the idea changed a lot. We made a ton of mistakes. And we ended up being in an enterprise sales business. You know, we had to sell the big brands, the Sony, MTV, the music labels, the movie studios. And it was hard, because I'm a programmer. And I'd never been in a meeting before because I'd never had a real job. And so suddenly I was going into these meetings with these big companies and I was thinking, what do I do here? How do I talk to these people? And uh, I read the book on customer development, the one that came before the, the Startup Owner's Manual, uh, The Four Steps to the Epiphany. And it, it totally, or I thought it was changing my life. I was like, this is incredible. This is exactly what I've been waiting for. And so I stopped everything I was doing, and I spent all of my time, as much as I possibly could, just out in meetings talking to customers full time. Because I thought, we're trying to build a company that scales. We'd already raised a bit of funding. We raised about a million dollars. And I was really stressed out because our business didn't work yet. And so I thought, well, talking to customers, this is the magic bullet. This is what I got to go do. And so I always, I, I like learned sales. I spent so much time. I bought a suit and cufflinks. And I went to all these meetings. and. Then we still went out of business. And I was like, what happened there? Like, I was doing what I was supposed to do. I was talking to customers. And the customers were saying, yeah, I'm definitely gonna buy that. Yes, I love that. Yes, this is perfect. And then they never paid us. And so I was like, this is actually harder than it sounds, right? There's something I was missing. So over the, the you know, since then, I, I think I've seen what I did wrong. And today I just wanna share that with you so that you can get the foundations right so that when you're out there talking to people, you can make sure it's a really good use of your time. Because you guys are busy, right? There are only so many hours in the day. The most important things a startup has, one is good co-founders, and another is the founder's time and attention. And if you're wasting your time and attention going to meetings that don't matter, or like getting feedback that's not real for your business, then like, ah, it's crazy, right? That's gonna be hard. So hopefully this is helpful, and when you do want to spend the time, you can do so a lot more effectively. Um, you met some of the, the founder-centric team yesterday. Uh, I'm another one, I'm Rob. And yeah, anyway. <laughs> Every startup is different. This is the, the kind of tricky part about giving and following startup advice. My business is different than your business, so I can't really tell you how to run it. You know, if I'm the guy on the top and I say, you just gotta jump twice and then walk up the hill, and your business looks like the one on the bottom, you jump twice, you end up in a pit, you go out of business. And so all we can do, and what you need to do for yourself, is learn the tools to navigate the, the terrain, the road of your own business. Uh, and talking to customers is one of these really important tools. You know, the lean startup stuff, the minimum viable products, um, 
design thinking, user experience, business models, all these are different tools that help you make sense of your own landscape and, and make better decisions. Once your business gets to a certain point and you have a product, and it's basically the right product, well, you actually don't know if it's the right product, but you can find that out relatively easily because you go to someone and you say, hey, I've got this product, do you want to buy it? And if someone gives you their money, it's a pretty sure thing that they like what you're doing. They care about it, right? There's no room for biases there. If I come up to you and I go, hey, I got a great idea, you're gonna go, that sounds like a great idea, Rob. If I go, hey, do you want to pre-order it? You're gonna go, I'm not so sure about that. And so once we've got this, once we can put people to a real purchase decision, suddenly it's very easy to get good feedback. But it would be great if we could get feedback even earlier than that. Because sometimes building the first version, it takes you quite a few months. Maybe you've only got three or six months to work on this business, and if you spend that all, on the first version, you lose a lot of flexibility. It's harder to make mistakes safely. So, you know, we can't just say, hey, you know, here it is, like, pay me. This is what Kickstarter does so amazingly. Kickstarter lets us figure out if people are gonna pay us before we've, we've built it. And at its best, talking to customers, customer development, it's another way to figure out if people are gonna pay us before we've built it. So, because growth, <laughs> growth is expensive. Until you start trying to grow, everything's very cheap. You know, if you make a mistake and it's you and your co-founder working out of the garage or the living room, it's like, whoops, we made a mistake, let's try something else. If you make that same mistake when you've already hired a head of sales or you're spending a lot of money on advertising or PR, it's really, really hard to make those mistakes because they kill you, they're so expensive. Because your, your burn rate, your expenses are so high. Um, and this is why the normal path of building a business, saying, you know, I have a visionary idea. Um, I'm going to get the designers to design it, and the programmers to program it, and the marketing people to come up with an awesome launch campaign. And then we're going to do it, and we're going to put all of our money into this launch campaign, uh, and then hopefully we still have some money left. This is the way it used to get, get done, um, and this is what Bob was, was talking about uh, yesterday morning. This is not a good way to run a business, and we all kind of know that. Um, and so we want to talk to people to figure out, to make sure that we're building the right thing. And the biggest mistake we make, I call this the feedback fallacy. We believe that by talking to people about our idea, we're getting good data, we're getting good information. But actually, a lot of the time, we're not. If I come to you, um, like imagine this, this conversation. Um, you know, I, I come to you, I, I have an idea, I'm asking, what do you think? It's hard for you to know, what do you tell me? You know, maybe I just quit my job and I'm really nervous and this is my first big idea and I'm asking you for feedback. Even if you're a stranger, you're still kind of like, you don't want to totally be completely honest, you know? Maybe you're like, well, I don't know, it sounds really cool. Um, and that's not enough, that's someone's opinion. An opinion is not enough for us to confidently build our business. We want facts, we want real data. Um, and so, when we go and we talk about our idea, a lot of what we're doing is actually fishing for compliments. It's saying, hey, I got a great idea, do you like it? Yeah, I like it, and then we move on. But we haven't really learned anything. Um, you know, it's like, it's exposing our ego. It's saying, you know, you really care about your idea, and so, it's just hard for people to be truthful. Um, imagine two different conversations. Uh, like Bob said, you shouldn't ask your mom whether your idea is a good idea or a bad idea. And that's true, but I would take it even further. I would say you shouldn't ask anyone if your idea is good or bad. Because there's a better way of getting the information you need, at least in the early days. Um, and actually, I think that we should take the responsibility ourselves of finding a way to ask good questions. Good questions are, they just cannot, they don't invite compliments. They, they, it doesn't even matter if the person buys. A great question you can ask to your mom, and you still get good data, because it's not about you, it's not about your idea or your ego. Um, so imagine that, that I go to my mom and I have an idea for a cookbook, uh, iPad app, and I say, hey mom, I've got this awesome idea for a cookbook, iPad app. It's got videos, it's got recipes, it's gonna be really fun, it's got your favorite celebrity chefs. You can send the, the recipe list to your iPhone so that when you're in the uh, grocery store, you can see all the recipes and buy them. You know, and it only costs uh, five euros. It's cheaper than the cookbooks that you buy that are already on your shelf. What's she gonna say? She's gonna say, well, that sounds like a really cool idea. You know, you're very smart, I'm proud of you. And all we got there was a compliment. But if you told anyone that, you go to a networking event and you go, hey, what do you do? Oh, I've got an awesome startup idea, it does this, this, this. Oh, that sounds really cool. I also have an awesome startup idea, it does this, this, this. There's no real learning or information being exchanged there, right? 
Uh, and if we go into the same conversation, but instead of talking about our idea, we talk about our customer's life, we get a very different kind of information, and we can actually learn something that matters. So imagine I go, hey mom, you got the iPad, how do you like it? She goes, oh, I love it, I use it every day. Which apps do you use? Angry Birds, Sudoku, New York Times? How did you find out about them? Oh, in the Sunday newspaper, there's a section on the recommended app of the week. I just download it. You go, you don't ever search in the app store? She goes, you can search in the app store? And we're like, okay, so our original launch plan of just putting it in the app store and hoping we go to number one, maybe that's not gonna work so well. But actually we've learned that traditional PR through newspapers, through magazines, that might be a great route for our type of customer. So we've already learned something even though we were talking to the most biased person in the world. So we continue, we go, we go hey, that shelf full of cookbooks. When's the last time you bought a cookbook? She goes, why would I ever buy a cookbook? I've been cooking for 30 years. I know all my favorite recipes. We go, oh man, our idea just got completely disproven. Our target customer does not want to buy our product. You know? And we didn't even have to talk about our idea to get that information. We just talked about her life, her purchasing behaviors, what she's already done in the past. And she's biased. This is our mom, but we're still getting good data. So maybe we push a little bit further. We say, well, okay, so you don't buy cookbooks, but when's the last time you did buy one? She goes, well, you know, actually three months ago, uh, I wanted to learn some new vegetarian recipes, and my vegetables, they, weren't, they were kind of bland, they were kind of boring, so I bought a vegetarian cookbook. So now we've gone, aha, our customer, they probably don't want to buy generic recipes, but maybe whenever a new diet trend comes out, or there's a popular type of ethnic cooking, you know, like she wants to learn to cook Mexican food, or she wants to learn to cook British recipes, uh, then maybe there's small like, add-ons that we can sell. So the main recipes are free, and you buy these special uh, diet recipe packs. Again, interesting idea. We don't know if it's true. It's still a guess. But it's a guess that's coming from our customer's life. And we've learned that our, the way we were thinking about doing it, get all the recipes that are in a cookbook and launch it into the app store, is doomed to fail. And if we have a few of these conversations, we never even to men- need to mention our idea. And that's how we find out what people really care about. It's like you talk about their life, you leave your idea out of it. This is so hard to do. Because in your head, you're like, she's like, I never buy a cookbook. And you go, yeah, but what if it was on an iPad? You like really want to get your idea back in there. But you gotta leave it out. That's how you figure out the truth about what people care about. Um, like a popular type of idea, maybe someone in this room is working on it, um, a lot of people have tried before, is an app to do travel planning, to manage your, your flights, your hotels, where you want to go, like the fun stuff to do. And it, it's difficult because we all look at the market and we go, wow, there's no good travel planning app that everyone uses. That seems like an opportunity. And then we show it to people, we go, isn't travel planning annoying? And they go, yeah, I hate travel planning. And then we say, like, well, look at my app idea. Isn't this a cool idea? Wouldn't this solve all your problems? And they go, wow, yeah, that would solve all my problems. So it seems like it's a really good idea, but then you talk to those same people and you go, hey, the last time you needed to talk, plan a trip, talk me through what you did. And they're gonna say, well, you know, I just bought a ticket to that place my friend told me was good, and then I went. We go, did you do any research? And they're like, I foursquared it. We go, did you search around the app store? Did you look for any travel planning apps? And they go, no. Why would I do that? And maybe they say, yeah, actually I did. I searched for hours. I couldn't find anything good. I tried 10 different apps. They all suck. I'm desperate for a good one. That person is gonna become a customer. But the person goes, no, I didn't really think to search. Huh. That's actually the response to a lot of of our our situations, to our, our startup ideas. Like, I had a great idea, great idea, you know, for tools for self-publishing authors to make websites for their book, to promote their books themselves. And I thought, wow, they have such terrible websites. I could do that better, so I made this awesome tool. It didn't take me that long, it took a month or two. And I showed all the authors, I said, look, now you can make great websites. And they're like, we don't care about that, though. You know, and I thought that if I showed it to anyone, they'd go, oh, that's really neat, it's really easy. So we want to get into what they're already doing and why. It's like, hey, your website sucks. And they go, yeah, I know. It's like, why? Doesn't that bother you? And they go, no, it's okay. I mean, most of my readers just look at Amazon. So again, leave your idea out of it, talk about their life. You get really different types of information, and it avoids all these biases. Um, Because when we talk about our idea, we get compliments. And compliments feel good, but they mislead us. They're bad data. You gotta take notes on your meetings, and every time you see a compliment, 
and your notes, just strike it out. Just ignore it. Compliments don't count. It's the facts about their life. That's where you really figure out, are they going to be a customer or just someone who gives me a compliment? Um, you know, startups go through different stages as well. Um, in customer development, they call the first stage customer discovery and the second stage customer validation. Um, or you might call it search and execution. I think of it as learn and confirm. And at the beginning, in the first stage, your idea has nothing to do with it. All you're trying to do is learn what your customers care about, how their lives work, what their problems are, what their goals are, what they're already trying to do. Um, and then later, you take all that knowledge, you come up with your idea. You build an awesome prototype. You come up with a cool minimum viable product. You come up with a clever way to pitch it to them, you know, to, to ask them to pre-order it. You do a Kickstarter. And that's the confirm stage. You're sort of saying, based on everything I understand about my customers, have I come up with the right product? Uh, and once we get to confirm, we have a bit of a problem because now you've got a product, so as soon as you show your product to people, you start inviting these compliments and these biases again. So we've got to find a way to get around that. Um, you know, to summarize the, the, the first bit, it's learn, we talk about their life, we never talk about our idea. Um, Talking about our idea is fishing for compliments. It's exposing our ego. It's not too useful. Um, and one kind of twist on this that you'll hear sometimes is, you know, someone goes, hey, this is my idea. The other person goes, yeah, it's not really for me. And, and the first person goes, no, 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 you don't get it. And this is like, there's this funny rule that if you're annoying enough about it, you can get anyone to say that like your startup. It's just like in a bar, if you're annoying enough, you can always get a fake phone number. You just don't leave the person alone. It's like, but that's not good data, right? That's not useful, it doesn't help you. Uh, you want to like leave that, like these just these forced compliments. So you want to avoid the compliments, you don't want to demand the compliments. Uh, when you reach the confirmed stage, you've got the product, and the way you get around the biases then is you ask for commitments, not opinions. If I bring a product to you, I mean, I mentioned this at the very beginning, uh, but it's worth repeating. If I bring a product to you and I go, what do you think? I'm not gonna get good data. I'm going to get compliments, I'm going to get opinions. And opinions are interesting, because especially when you're talking to venture capitalists, to investors, because you really want to take their opinion seriously. Um, like, our investors treated us so well, I love our investors. Um, I don't have investors at the moment, you know, because I'm building a different sort of business, but investors are wrong most of the time. That's just the way the, the, the math works, right? Even the best investors, they might have one out of five that really goes according to how they thought it would. And so that means their honest opinion, their opinion that they believe so sincerely that they're gonna commit their money to it, is still usually wrong. And they're the best in the world. It is literally their job to predict the future and to bet on it. And if they're wrong 80% of the time, how seriously can you take anyone's opinion? You know? The opinions just don't matter. If you ask me and I say I hate your business, that's irrelevant, it doesn't matter, it's just my opinion. I'm probably wrong. If I say I love your business, I'm probably wrong too. Neither of that is good data. You know, it's just like, you gotta be responsible for going out and getting the information about your customers and then come into your own decision. I'm not saying ignore everyone, right? There's great knowledge that's out there. Um, but don't just take the, the opinions as facts. When we've got the product, the way you get around this is with commitments. And there's three different types of commitments that, that I like to think of. Time, reputation, and money. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of each, but uh, there was a founder, a great founder, I think uh, Devin mentioned him yesterday, uh, Stephen, or Jordan did, Stephen Rappaport from, from Pat Coffee. And now the business is doing brilliantly. They just raised an incredible uh, Series A. Uh, it's growing very fast. It's a subscription e-commerce business. It's a copy subscription, which doesn't sound like a very interesting business, but he's doing so well, and he's been running it brilliantly. And I remember when he first had the idea, he came up to me and he said, Rob, I want to get your feedback on something. You know, and he talked to me about my coffee purchasing, he talked to me about uh, the, the, how annoyed I was when I ran out of coffee, and he said, isn't that a great idea? And I said, yes, yeah, Stephen, I love it. You're gonna be really successful. You know, he just asked for my opinion and I've given him a compliment, even though I really wanted to help him, but I didn't know what else to do. And then he said, I'm really happy you said that, and he pulled out his iPad and he said, enter your bank details. <laughs> and I said, wait, 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 I need a minute. Like, let me actually think about this. And he goes, I'm not gonna charge you yet, but when it's ready in like six weeks, I'm gonna bill you, and I'm gonna start sending you coffee. Do you want it? 
And so I thought, and I needed a moment of silence, and, and this is the first time in the entire conversation that I actually seriously considered whether I was a customer, even though I really wanted to help him, you know? And I actually did end up paying him. I became one of his first customers. And he actually didn't start the business until he had 50 people who had prepaid. And then as soon as he got 50, he just had their bank accounts in a spreadsheet, hugely insecure, I'm sure. <laughs> and then one day he went around to all the addresses and he pushed, he literally had envelopes full of coffee beans that he pushed through our mailboxes. And on it he'd written in marker packed coffee. It's like, here you go, here's your coffee, give me my seven pounds. And this was awesome. This is how you get around the, the, the compliments. You get around the compliments by asking for a commitment. If someone comes up to you on the street, they go, hey, do you like my shirt? You're gonna go, yeah, that's a really nice shirt. If they go, hey, do you wanna buy my shirt? You're gonna go, no, I'm okay, I'm happy with my shirt, thank you. Uh, we, we wanna ask for commitments. Asking for money is the best. Ideally, people just pay you, right? That's great, they pay you. You know that they're not lying. Uh, <laughs> If you can't get them to pay you, you can get them to pre-order it. If you can't do that, you can get them to put down a deposit. If you can't do that, you can get them to sign a letter of intent. All of these are different types of commitments around money. The slightly lesser but still really useful form of commitment is reputation. And reputation is one of my favorites. It's what I use the most because it's really easy to ask for. If you're in a meeting with someone, let's say that uh, you're selling something to school teachers and you talk to a school teacher, and the school teacher goes, wow, that's incredible, that's an amazing idea. I can't wait till you launch so we can try it. And you go, well, I'm really happy you said that. I would love to talk to more teachers. Can you introduce me to your coworkers? Do you know any teachers at another school that I can talk to? And if they say, yeah, they're gonna love to hear about this, this is amazing. Let me introduce you to all these people, and they start shooting out emails. You can take their feedback really, really seriously because they're giving you something. They're giving you some of their reputation. VCs are the same way. Um, if you talk to an investor and he goes, I love it, keep me in the loop, that's quite different than if he says, I love it, keep me in the loop, and you say, well, can you introduce me? I saw one of your portfolio companies is really relevant to what we do. Can you introduce me to that portfolio company? If the investor then says, yeah, absolutely, they're gonna love to talk to you, you can take their feedback and their, their intent to invest a lot more seriously than if they go, you know, maybe a bit later. Uh, so these aren't ways, you're not trying to force people to give you connections. You're not trying to force people to give you compliments. You're just trying to find out how much do they really care. Uh, the last one you can ask for, uh, oh, another great reputation thing is case studies and testimonials. If you talk to someone, they say, I love it. You say, hey, would you be willing to be a case study when we launch? We're going to put you on the website. We're going to write up about your experiences. Uh, we're going to give a great link back to your site. It's going to show that you're this innovative company using cool new startup technology. If they say, we would love to be a case study, thank you so much, that's incredible. We get early access and it's free? Yes. Then you can, again, they're really likely to become a customer. If they say, if they say, ooh, you know, we're more comfortable with mature software, why don't we wait until you've launched and then we'll give it a try and let you know how it goes. Again, they may become a customer later, but they're not gonna be one of your first customers. And ultimately, this is the question that customer development exists to answer. Right, what's customer development about? You know, you might say it's about interviews, or it's about surveys, or it's about learning. No. Customer development is about getting customers, right? You just have to learn on your way toward that. The point of product development, at the end of product development, what do you have? You've got a product. At the end of customer development, you've got customers. If you do your customer development and you don't end up with customers at some point, then like something went wrong, right? And so, we get distracted in all the tools, but ultimately let's see about figuring out, is this type of person, and then later is this particular person, are they going to become a customer? Because without customers, you got no business, right? Bob said it well, it's the customer's opinion that matters, and that's all that matters. Um, the last one we can ask for is time. Time is the weakest of the commitments, because some people will give you time just because they like you, and not because they're gonna become a customer. But asking for time is still better than nothing. Uh, so, one time I, I, was, I was very early in the product development process and I had a great meeting with a potential customer. She said, I love it, we're definitely gonna use this, it's incredible, and I take that as compliment, false promise, compliment. There's no commitment there, so I just ignore all of that. So then I'm looking for a chance to really put her to a decision. So I just invented a time commitment that I could ask her for. 
And I said, well, listen, it would be really helpful for me to be able to sit down with your development team. Can I come in next week and spend a couple of hours with your whole development team to really understand how they work, to make sure this is a great fit for them? And I'm not trying to force this on her, right? It's just an offer. And the idea is that if she's really, really excited about the product, she's going to be thrilled to offer me the chance to talk to her developer so that I can make it better for her. If she doesn't like the product, if she's not that excited, she's just not going to give me that time. Right? That makes sense. So by putting to her to a decision, I get better information. Uh, and one way I like to think about this is I end every meeting by creating an opportunity for them to reject me. This is the opposite of pushy sales. In pushy sales, you, you never give them a chance to reject you. You say, so you want it, you want it, when do we start? How much do you want to pay me? What color do you want it in? It's cheesy and it doesn't work. What we want to do is we're trying to find out who really loves this. You know, Because it's a bit crazy to buy anything from a startup. They could buy it from a big established company. They're choosing to buy it from you because they really, really want what you're selling. And so it's just putting, uh, putting this, this, this commitment, this opportunity for them to say, yeah, I really want it, and I'm going to give you something of value. That, that's how we get to the truth. We have more information. And if some people reject you, that's OK. One of my big breakthroughs with sales, I hated sales when I started. I was so bad at it. Um, Incidentally, a side point, you can learn any skill. It just takes a while and it's painful. If, if you're not a programmer, you can learn how to program. It's just going to take you a couple years. You know, If you're not a salesperson, you want to learn sales, you can learn it. It'll take you a couple years. Now I can sell at a pretty reasonable level. And I've actually found that really useful for my startup career. It, again, painful couple years to learn it. But you, when you look at your own skill set, you can learn this stuff. So don't let not having a skill hold you back. Um, I totally lost my train of thought. Anyway, the, you know, you, hmm. <laughs> what is it there? Uh, <laughs> so when we go through these stages, right, it, it, the, your, your sales, as you go through them, customer development ultimately ends up turning into sales. There's a very natural progression from I'm trying to learn about the industry and about what you care about to like, okay, I've really got it. I understand you in particular. I've come up with a product that solves your problems. I'm gonna give it to you to confirm that I was correct. And you're either gonna give me something you value or I realize I was wrong. And realizing you're wrong, this is what I was saying earlier, I remembered it. Realizing you're wrong is great. This was a big breakthrough for me uh, in sales because it used to make me nervous. And the reason it made me nervous is I thought I needed to like win at every meeting. I thought it was only a good meeting if they paid me at the end of it. And so when a meeting was going badly, that made me really nervous. I was like, ah, I let down my team again. I screwed up again. I didn't get the sale again. And it was really stressful. And, and then that made me want to be a pushy salesperson to say, pay me, pay me. And that I didn't like. It didn't feel honest. And what I realized is that, especially in the early days, most sales meetings, they hate you. And they hate it. And that's totally fine because they weren't your customers. You know, so a big part of the early thing is figuring out who's that small group of people that really, really loves it. Um, Paul Bouquet, he's a brilliant guy. He's now a partner at Y Combinator. And before that, he built, um, he was the, one of the first engineers at Google. And he built, uh, he came up with Google's advertising system, which obviously was a big deal for Google. And he came up with Gmail. He single handedly built Gmail. And then he left Google. He started FriendFeed. A year later, he sold that to Facebook. And FriendFeed became the newsfeed, which we all now know and love. So this guy's really good at building products that people love, that people use in a big way. And his view, uh, it's counterintuitive, but I really believe it. It's that in order to scale later, you need to ignore scale for now. This conference is about growth, but in order to grow, you need to have good foundations. And so his view is that you do not grow until 100 people love the product so much and they use it every day, they use it so much, it's so important to them, that if you take it away from them, they will try to fight you. You know, like imagine if you got an early version of the, like the first iPad, and it was, you were one of the first hundred people to get it, and then one day Steve Jobs walks into your office, and it's like, okay, I need that back now. You would be annoyed, right, because you love it. You're like, no, it's mine, I want it, how much do I have to pay you? And that's because it's like you stay small until you can create that love, because, Imagine you've got a crappy product that millions of people kind of like. It's very hard to later get millions of people to go from kind of liking it to totally loving it. Like you can't deepen that emotion for the whole world. 
Um, but if you have a few people who totally love it, it's like this really deep emotion. Even if there's just a hundred of them, you can then later start broadening that love out to the rest of the market. You know, this is what Facebook did. Facebook didn't start with the whole world. They started with one or two universities. This is what Gmail did. Paul didn't release Gmail to the world until everyone inside Google was like, I desperately need this tool. Uh, you know, you like start small, and it's counterintuitive, but to grow later, we need to stay small now and really focus on what matters, which is, is making sure that we're building something people love. Uh, and as you do that, it very naturally transitions from learning into rapid users, into people paying you. And then once they start paying you, you know, you've answered those first couple business model questions and you're in a great place to start expanding, growing, you know, raising money, whatever you want to do for the, for the future of the business. One point that I'll make about this is that it's easy to lose a lot of time in these meetings. People think a meeting takes an hour, but actually a meeting takes four hours because you need to send a bunch of emails, you need to arrange a calendar time, you need to travel there, you need to travel back, you need to update your team on how it went, you need to send follow-up emails. Every meeting you take just removes half a day of progress from your startup. And so the meetings you do take, it better be pretty important. And I really believe in this, I think it is worth the time, but if you're gonna do it, you gotta do it right. Because if you go into a meeting, you waste half a day getting compliments, like that does a disservice to your startup and your time. Like you could have spent that time in the bar drinking mojitos. That's a better use of half a day than having a meeting that doesn't matter. Uh, and also you'll learn that sometimes you don't even need the meeting. If you're going in in a formal meeting, a formal sales pitch, you know, you're saying, here's my product, look at my slides, look how great it is, big fancy presentation, sell, 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 then yeah, it takes an hour. And like you need to do all this stuff. But if you're just trying to talk to someone about their life and understand what they care about and what their goals are, what their current solutions are, all the stuff we talked about, that takes like five minutes. And you can do it anywhere. Like, how many of you are building uh, applications for consumers? Awesome, right? So everyone here is in your target market. So when you bump into someone, say you're building, um, say you're building a travel planning app. Like, when you bump into someone, go, hey, weird question, how did you plan your last trip? Talk me through that. So you're building a cookbook app. Go, hey, crazy question. Do you cook? How did you learn to? Where do you get your recipes from? Do you Google them on, or do you search them on YouTube? You know, do you, do you buy cookbooks? What do you do? Leave your idea out of it. They'll kind of know what you're doing. Um, but people don't lie to you when they're, they're answering facts about their life. Um, and once you start doing this, you'll realize that you can actually do customer development anywhere. You do not need to set up meetings. You do not need to have this, like, this difficult, time-consuming commutes. It just becomes part of your everyday. One of my products was for public speakers, because I was like, hey, I, can, I go to conferences, so I meet other people who go to conferences. It seems like I could build a product for them. You know, it's easy for me to find them, I can sell to them, sure. And, and I remember the way I got my very first, uh, very first user is I was at a friend's engagement party, and we were on a rooftop and we were drinking cocktails or something, and I heard, you know, across the room, in the corner of my ear, I heard someone say, blah, 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 my talk in Tokyo next week. And I thought, aha, a customer. And, and so I ran over there and I said, I said, hello, I'm Rob. Weird question. I heard you're going to a talk in Tokyo next week. That's crazy. How did you get that? Because um, my, my product was going to be to help public speakers get speaking gigs. I was like, how did you get this talk in Tokyo? And she said, oh, it's, you know, part of my job, blah, 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 lots of leads come in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and as we talked, we talked for five minutes, and I totally understood that she was a perfect customer. And I never mentioned my product. And so at the end of it, I was like, ah, I need to ask for a commitment, you know, because you got to put them to a decision to really figure out if you're right or not. So I was about to walk away, and I'm like, ah, okay, I know this is really weird now, but I'm building this product. It's for people like you. I know your talk's like next week and my product hasn't been tested and this is a big deal for you and you probably should not use an untested product at your big talk, but do you want to? And she goes, yes, absolutely, I would love to try. And I'm like, it will probably break. Like, you're likely to be embarrassed on stage. And she's like, I don't care, I need this. And I'm like, okay, this person is a customer, right? They want it so badly that they're willing to risk a broken early version. Um, that's great, that's exactly the sort of feedback that you want and it lets you move forward in confidence. So that's my kind of threefold uh, advice on, on talking to customers. One, leave your idea out of it for as long as you can, just talk about their life. 
Secondly, if you do mention your idea, ask for a commitment. Time, money, reputation. Third, you know, be easy on yourself. This stuff doesn't need to take a lot of time. Find a way to work it into your day. Um, and that would lead me to one of my general points about, about startups, which is that it's a lot easier to do a startup if you choose customers who you like. And the reason I say customers you like is because it means that they're easy to get to. Um, if your customers are like Fortune 500 CEOs, it's really hard for you to reach them. So you want to learn what they care about, you want to, but they don't, you don't know any, and they don't take you seriously. So you have to spend like six months of your company just trying to talk to the right person. And that's really hard. It takes you a lot of time. Um, and so if there's a way that you can, you're like, hey, I'm an author, I should make a product for authors. You're like, hey, I'm a public speaker, I should make a product for public speakers. You're like, hey, I like going on skiing holidays. I'm gonna look for things around travel or skiing or holidays. If it's just people that you have a chance to bump into in your life, but it means you can learn a lot about whether you're on the right track uh, without actually having to spend like six months doing nothing but going to meetings. Um, I know this is hard and it's easy for me to say, like it's hard here and I know like a lot of you are looking at customers elsewhere in the world and this is admittedly difficult and this is one of the big challenges that, that you guys, it's like, it's so impressive how you know different teams are dealing with this and how the accelerators and the support groups and everything are working to connect into different countries. So I know I haven't had to deal with the problem as much as you have, but it's something to maybe keep in mind. If you can't talk to a customer to get feedback, then are you really gonna be able to sell to them later? So you can use that as an early like sanity check. So that's kind of my spiel, I guess. Um, so yeah, thanks a lot. When you're talking to people and you get good feedback, you know they really, really love it, and that's how you build a successful business. Uh, if you wanna know more, if you're in this stage of your startup, um, I would suggest that you grab this book that I wrote because it goes into more details. Um, and if you use the code Startup Next for the ebook, there's a little coupon code thing. It reduces the cost from 30 bucks to $1. So hopefully that fits within your bootstrapping budget. Um, so yeah, thanks so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, if there are questions, we can, we can question it up. Maybe the audience is just a little shy this <laughs> morning. Come on, guys. Come on, guys. Questions. Let's see if they back. Can we get a mic over there? Stand up again. Maybe a chance. <laughs> Out the idea. What's your suggestion? When's the best time? Thank you. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. The, uh, yeah, this is the hard. The, like you're talking to someone, and there's an expectation that when you're talking to them, like you have a product, and especially like it would be weird to go into a sales meeting and never show them the product. You, you know, people would be unhappy about that. They feel like you you didn't meet their expectations. And this is one of the reasons that I like avoiding meetings whenever uh, whenever I can. Because once you set up a meeting, it's an hour long, you have to travel to it, people really expect that you're gonna show them something and they get a bit mad if you don't. Uh, and so in that situation, yeah, I usually would stall it. So I go, I go, hey, so I've got a product, I'd love to get feedback on you, or feedback from you. Um, but if you wouldn't mind, like before I show it to you, I'd just love to know how you're dealing with this stuff already. Can we just talk about like the way you're, 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 how are you dealing with it? What else do you use? How does this work? And something that you'll usually have to say in this situation is you usually have to promise them that you're not gonna try to sell them anything. Because uh, like this happens when you're talking about budgets. So if you're one of my customers and I talk to you and I'm like, you know that I'm in this industry, you know that I'm in say the education industry and you're at school. And I go, hey, what are your budgets like for this? 
you're immediately like, whoa, 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 he's gonna try to take my whole budget. So you're, you're gonna stop telling me the truth. So in those cases, you need to kind of say like, hey, I've got a product, it's in this space, but it's not ready, I promise, I'm, I like, don't have anything to sell to you. Only say that if it's true, obviously. I don't have anything to sell to you, I'm really just trying to learn if I'm on the right track. I'd love to get your feedback on the product, um, maybe bring you in as an early free user, but before we do that, can we just talk about the way you're already dealing with this stuff? And that, that's kind of how I would balance it. Um, but with something like the public speaker on the rooftop, I never even needed to mention my idea because I didn't set that expectation. So if you can talk to people casually, often you can get away without even doing it. And most of the time I cuss out people, they don't know it ever happened. Um, my, my business partner, Celine, calls this cocktail customer development because it usually happens with a beer or a drink. And you're just at the bar. It's like, oh, weird question. How do you get your speaking gigs? And someone's like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And they just think it's a conversation. Whereas for me, I'm like learning if my business is gonna work or not. Uh, so keeping it casual can also help you deal with that. Does that help at all? <laughs> I don't have the clock, just as a heads up to the organizers, so I don't know how we're doing on time. Uh, hi. Hello. Selena. Uh, you mentioned something that I wanted to ask you more about. A lot of us are building products which are aimed clients overseas, not for the local market. And the challenge is how do we get customer development in such situations? Uh, shall we attempt uh, doing it here locally in Bulgaria, hoping that, hoping that this can transfer easily to another market? Or shall we go where our market is and try to build some relations there? It's really hard and I don't have a great answer for it. It's not something that I've really had to deal with. Um, I mean, in some ways I would say go to where your market is, but it's a big decision, obviously. So we started our company in San Francisco, but our customers, my very first cus company, our customers were big advertising agencies and big advertising brands, and they're all based in New York and in London. So we started, we spent the first two years in San Francisco, but then we knew we needed to move the whole company to be closer to our customers, because it was just every time I wanted to have a meeting, I had to get on a plane, and that was just impossible. And so we, we actually, we shopped around for investors, and we talked to investors in both New York and London, and we were fortunate to find really good investors in London. So we used that money, and we moved the whole company out to London. And it was hard, and one of our founders got deported, and that was a pain, and there were a bunch of issues, it was a big expense, it wasn't easy, but I don't see another way to do that particular business. However, what we could have done is we could have changed the business to be less dependent on talking to those customers. So we, if you're going uh, business to consumer, if you're, like, you're marketing driven, you're out into the world, you need to understand them, but it, it's like, it tends to be a lot more of your learning comes from putting the product into their hands. So like, if you're building a game, say, you, you can only do so much customer development on a game. You go to someone, you go, hey, do you like having fun? You know, imagine something that is even more fun than the fun you're already having. Do you think you would like that? It's like you can't really get to any meaningful information because there's no real goal, there's no real problem. So in that case, all you can do is build a prototype as quickly as possible and start putting it in front of people. In front of people. And this is an approach that some companies who are now big have taken. So like customer development is just one tool, this, this style of conversations. And a company like Pinterest took a very different approach. So Pinterest was built by designers and techies, and they launched the first version. They basically said, we have no idea what this is for, but it seems cool. Let's put it out on the internet and see who likes it. And so they put it out there, and they found out that the people who liked it were designers showing off their portfolios, and wedding planners who were collecting inspiration for their, their weddings. And so at that point, they were like, aha, we get who likes it. So then they started going to every design conference and every wedding planning conference they could find. And like they started really learning why do you like it so much, how does it work. Um, so they almost did it in reverse. They didn't talk to their customers and then build the thing, they built the thing, then talked to the customers who already seemed to like it. I don't know that I would recommend one or the other. I think they fit different types of companies. Um, and then I know that, that some, some people have gotten pretty good results from doing their customer development through Skype. Personally, I do not like this at all because you often have to pay people to get on Skype with you because there's not that like human connection. 
Or if they're doing it, they're doing it as a favor, they're trying to get off Skype as quickly as possible. You can't read these subtle cues. You can't just have a conversation about their life on Skype because they're kind of like, what's the point? Where are we going? Uh, so for me, it's like, it's gotta be in person. Um, and, and yeah, that's, it's a difficult thing. It's either like change the idea, change where the company is, find someone who can, who can go out there. All right, well, let's thank Rob. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Okay, if you, uh, if you want to go to the startup next, one dollar. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you for having me.